Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Maya Schoenbach, and I'm a clinical psychologist, and I work here at TrickStop. And today we're going to be talking about the impact of social media on trichotillomania or on hair pulling disorder. So today's presentation is going to be around 45 minutes. Um, and I really encourage you guys throughout the presentation to ask questions that you have in the chat. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll do a Q&A session together. I'll answer all the questions um, all at once uh, together at the end. Um, and also, I really encourage you guys to stick around because there's going to be a promo code at the end of the presentation uh, for a discount on um, subscribing to our program to TrickStop. So definitely stick around for that. So let's get started. All right, so just a brief outline of what we'll talk about today. So first we'll go through a brief overview of what uh, social media is of our users today. Um, we'll talk about social media and body image specifically. We'll talk about social media and mental health challenges in general, and then also specifically for trichotillomania. We'll talk about some pros and cons of it. Um, we'll talk about our uh, social media platforms that we have here at TrickStop, and then we'll do a conclusion. And then, like I said, we'll finish off today with a Q&A session. So let's get started. Okay, so I wanted to start with a quote uh, by Katie Bannon. So she is a writer and a mental health advocate, and she herself is struggling with trichotillomania. And so she writes, today I watched hashtag trichotillomania videos on TikTok, which have over 200 million views. And I follow Instagram pages with hair pulling memes. I also see a therapist regularly. I attend annual conferences with hundreds of hair pullers. Social media continues to play a critical role in my day-to-day -day life. It provides regular reminders that I'm not the only one, that others who have bald spots and experience multi-hour plucking episodes are still worthy of love and happiness, that if I need support, I can find it. So I think that this quote really kind of symbolizes this idea that um, social media really provides, uh, at the end of the day, a safe space, a community, an opportunity for, for connection for people struggling with very similar challenges um, to you, to people with uh, trichotillomania. So uh, I think that's kind of like the overarching tone that I want to set for uh, this presentation today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about social media. So when we talk about social media, we kind of talk about the big five. We have, first of all, YouTube, I put all the little logos here. So we have YouTube, we have Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat. And in 2024, the majority of youth and adults use social media platforms. And the biggest demographic here is adolescents. So 85%, this is a study from 2020, so four years already, but 85% of 14 year olds use social media. So that's a huge number. I don't know if that surprises any of you, that number kind of surprised me, but um, maybe it's not so surprising. <laughs> um, but yeah, huge, huge numbers. Okay, so next I wanna talk a little bit about social media and body image, because I think we have a lot of preconceived notion of social media and how it can impact us, but let's really get into the how, what, and why of it. Okay, so first of all, a lot of research on body image and social media is done in the adolescent population. And first of all, like we saw adolescents, it's a huge demographic that uses social media. And then also in terms of for body image, adolescents, it's a period of time that's really characterized by specific developmental needs. So these include um, heightened importance of peer, of social acceptance. It's a time that uh, you're exploring your identity and you're really forming your identity and who you are. And social media tries, <laughs> um, tries to, but it does, it pro provides kind of an ideal platform for fulfilling these developmental needs. 
However, social media, it's typically dominated by photos. Um, and usually these present, these photos present these appearance focused and idealized content, um, meaning that they, they're presenting this ideal lifestyle or these perfect images of people that they want to put out there. Um, and this, in, in the end, shows that there is a relationship Research shows that there is a relationship between social media use and having poor body satisfaction. So how do we understand this? Is that basically the idea is that when people see a lot of things on social media or they hear about things in society that talk about how we should look or we should act, then we start to believe it. And then this in turn can make us feel bad about ourselves because we start to compare ourselves to how, for example, how we look to these perfect images that we see online that we can never achieve because they're unrealistic. Maybe they've been Photoshopped, maybe they, they, they've been edited, maybe they've been generated by AI, who knows? <laughs> um, and ultimately this idea of internalization, of comparison, of negative self-evaluation, it ultimately leaves, leads to poor body satisfaction. So if we think about it in terms of trichotillomania, so we have this societal value of having thick, luscious hair. So people with trichotillomania ultimately report having a reduced sense of self as a result of how they look because there's this societal standard. They're bombarded, if we're talking about social media, they're bombarded on social media all the time with images of people with this lush, beautiful hair, and then they'll start to compare themselves. Oh wait, I have a bald spot here. Oh wait, I plucked, I, I picked, I pulled here, so now I have a bald spot here. I don't look like that person, why? And then you start to get into a loop and you feel bad about yourself. And that is a loop that can be attributed to this relationship between diminished body image and uh, social media. Okay, so let's talk about social media and mental health challenges in general. So first I wanna talk about some potential triggers. So first and foremost, I need to say, it's very, very difficult to control what you see on social media or the comments that you receive. So this means that you could encounter things that could trigger your urge to pull. So first and foremost, let's talk about visual triggers. So like we said, social media, it's very heavily focused on visuals. So for example, photos, videos on YouTube, videos on TikTok, reels on Instagram. Um, these can sometimes trigger pulling episodes. So for example, um, like we said, the idea of seeing someone with perfect hair, and then that can lead you to compare yourself to them and feel, feel badly about yourself. And then this could lead you to ultimately pull your hair as a result of these negative emotions. Um, another thing could be sometimes seeing videos of somebody, for example, maybe removing lash extensions um, in a makeup tutorial, something like that, that could lead to an urge and trigger a pulling episode. So these are all different things that could that are visual triggers. Stress and anxiety. So social media really can be a significant source of stress and anxiety for people. So first of all, you're maybe constantly receiving notifications. Maybe you're not receiving enough notifications. You might feel pressure to, to respond quickly, to engage. Um, and then, like I said, you, we also don't, have, unfortunately don't have control over what people comment. Um, and, and one of the issues of the internet is that there is a sense of anonymity that you, you're anonymous. So people turn into what we call keyboard warriors and then they can, start to write really negative comments and they, they can become bullies. Um, unfortunately, it's common. And so for many people struggling with hair pulling disorder, we know that stress is a very, very common trigger. So something that I really want to say is to definitely be aware of your stress levels when on social media. And then finally, like we said in the, the quote at the beginning of the presentation, social media, definitely can connect people. But the flip side of it is that it can also leave us feeling isolated and, and maybe disconnected even from reality. So um, it's 
it's also often exacerbated by, by this idea of comparison. So if you're comparing yourself to others online, like we discussed, then maybe you might feel like you don't measure up and then that could lead to this negative vicious cycle of comparing and feeling more isolated. So it's also very important to be aware of that. Okay. Um, so in terms of some cons of social media, so a big thing that I want to be aware of, everybody to be aware of is misinformation. So how does social media work is you get a feed on, say on TikTok, on Instagram, as you're scrolling through it, it the algorithm recognizes how long you spend on a certain image, on a certain type of content, and also it records how much you engage with it, if you like it, if you comment on it, if you share it. And so the, this algorithm, what it does is it ends up promoting popular rather than reliable content on social media. So that is very important because it can lead to misinformation. And um, first of all, so bullying, like we talked about already in terms of negative content, unfortunately com comment on social media and it can lead to having psychological psychologically negative impact on your self-image, on your self-esteem, um, and beyond um, mental, mental, psychologically, you can have physical uh, impact also. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, but there are these horrible challenges through peer pressure, like for example, this Tide Pod challenge that through peer pressure on the internet, on social media, people end up putting themselves uh, in risky situations, doing behaviors that are um, harmful to themselves. Um, and research also shows that there is a, an association between heavy use of social media and increased depression and anxiety. Now, the good thing is, is that this association might actually be uh, attenuated or lessened if uh, users feel like they have a, uh, a sense of belonging to a community or they use social media as a form of coping. So that kind of reminds me of like what we talked about at the beginning in terms of that quote. So the idea that you can use social media in a positive way, in a sense of community, but you need to be aware of the idea that if you go down a spiral that you end up, uh, that, you, that you're aware of the, this association between anxiety and depression. Okay. There's also a lot of different examples of articles and anecdotes of people who convince themselves that they have a mental health disorder from viewing social media content. So for example, here, this I provided, I put an uh, example of an article from the Wall Street Journal um, of a young woman who she, uh, through social media, and became convinced that she had a very rare personality disorder. Um, but like I said, so like I said, this is very dangerous because social media works off of these algorithms that feed us the information that we want to hear. So it can very, very quickly lead to a harmful spiral. And this is dangerous primarily because diagnosis can only be done by a mental health professional. So this is very important to not um, go with somebody's self-diagnosis. And then in terms of what you can do. So if somebody that you know and care about comes to you with a self-diagnosis, there's some things that experts say that you should and maybe shouldn't. So the first thing, I kind of underlined it here, is listen. So experts say it's best not to dismiss what the person has to say or even to react or show extreme emotion right away because in doing so, it really can cause the other person to shut down. So it's important to ask the person why, why they think they have that, that, that condition and and see, first of all, maybe the, the idea will pass. But if it doesn't, ask them if they want to talk to a medical, to a mental health professional, because that really is the best way to get support for, for these things. Another um, tip is to take a break. So sometimes just simply stepping away from social media for a while really can help. So for example, you can take a pause, you can delete the app. You can limit the amount of time. There's timers that you can put on your phone that you can limit how much time you're, you have access to certain apps, to Instagram, to TikTok. Um, 
So that's a really great way of taking a break or reducing the amount of uh, exposure that you have. And then also experts say that some of their teen patients have actually deleted their accounts. They started over, they deleted their accounts. They talk, uh, in an article, they specifically talked about um, TikTok, but they deleted their accounts. And then um, because of the algorithm, because the, the feed became so saturated with, with negative content, they just deleted the whole thing, opened a new account with a new user, and then caught the team that they consciously chose positive content. And that really helped because they, they were able to more thoughtfully curate what they were exposing themselves to and then be around more positive content as opposed to being bombarded with negative images and negative um, messaging all day. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some pros. <laughs> So um, a common uh, experience for people with uh, trypotillomania and health, mental health challenges in general is impaired social functioning. So the idea of having an online uh, community or an online interaction could be less daunting for people. Um, so for example, so we talked about anonymity already in terms of the keyboard warriors, but this idea of, um, Anonymity it can really facilitate a connection with other people, and you're doing this from the comfort of your own home. So it can facilitate social interaction. You can access a peer support network. You can engage with people. And something that we um, talk about at Trick, uh, Trick Stop is the idea that um, of, of sharing your story about trichotillomania with other people, uh, with loved ones, talking about it. And sometimes it's it's difficult for people to talk about it in with their immediate community with their friends with their family and so sometimes we suggest sharing online first with um in a support group or even with uh with uh a, an online forum anonymously sometimes that can be um a good first step in terms of talking about your trichotillomania it really can you still feel connection with people even though it's through a screen or even though it's through um it's done anonymously but it can sometimes be a really really good first step or it's sometimes just enough to start um in terms of challenging stigma like i said at the beginning it's it's um trichotillomania is something that's um really associated with a lot of shame with a lot of embarrassment um so uh, the idea of this community and seeing that there's other people in this world that are dealing with the same challenges that I am really challenges the stigma that you're alone dealing with this. And then in terms of mental health care, so health professionals often use, we use social media as an educational tool. We can share reliable health information. We can use, um, we can enhance our, our uh, mental health programs um, and services. So Things like TrickStop, we'll talk about uh, our platforms at the end, our social media platforms um, in a little bit. Okay, so in terms of pros of uh, social media, uh, I want to talk about a recent study that focused on analyzing the 100 most viewed YouTube videos on um, trichotillomania. And this was, uh, the study was done two years ago, so it's very recent. Um, so what they did was they, or what they found was that the majority of these videos it actually consisted of self-recorded narratives of people who they themselves were directly experiencing trichotillomania. And so what the study did was they analyzed the videos for content and found that the majority of the videos had messages aimed at providing support offering hope, uh, imparting education about trichotillomania. Um, and they often incorporated discussions about potential treatments. Um, and really they provided just really good, valuable information to the online trichotillomania community. So the overarching tone of these videos was really found to be characterized um, by encouragement, by, by providing empathy, fostering a sense of solidarity among people um, who are all grappling with trichotillomania and really trying to mitigate the stigma that's associated with it. So interestingly, and 
positively, that the study didn't find any videos that were encouraging hair pulling behaviors. However, the authors did specifically write that the video content could still have risks, like triggering the urge to pull hair more. So like we talked about earlier about the idea of triggers. So the authors concluded that for people grappling with trichotillomania, which is, they said specifically, a condition often involving stigma and secrecy, social media platforms offer a uniquely valuable opportunity for communal support and understanding. So that's really, uh, goes along with the first quote that I talked about. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about now uh, the social media that we have here at TrickStop. And these are actually great pages for if you yourself um, are struggling with uh, trichotillomania that you can actually ask your loved ones, um, your friends, your family members um, to follow these pages because they're great resources to learn more about the disorder, to learn how you can better support person struggling with trichotillomania, um, or if you yourself want to learn more about it. Okay, so first we have um, our Facebook group. So it offers support, resources, um, members share their experiences, they talk about coping strategies. Um, it's really a non-judgmental environment to offer encouragement, to, to have a sense of community, solidarity, um, and really, a lot of our users say that they feel kind of a sense of relief that they, like the quote said, that they really didn't know that these groups existed. Um, so that's really a kind of beneficial thing. So we also have a TikTok that you can follow. So here on TikTok and also on Instagram, we have a new um, series that we call the Beyond the Surface. So we have experts answering all of your different questions about trichotillomania. So you can submit your questions and they'll get answered. You can just watch the videos to learn new up-to-date information about hair pulling disorder. And then also we have our Instagram page. Um, and that's also a really great space for support, for encouragement. You can find inspiration, you can find tips. Um, and then here we also provide reminders about our free webinars and our live online events so that you can attend. So I wonder if you guys are already following because you're here. Um, but uh, it's also a great space for other um, information as well. So I really suggest following that page. And then finally, I want to mention our YouTube channel. So here you can watch past recordings of our webinars all the way till 2020, I checked. <laughs> um, and we have content webinars where we have experts sharing information on trichotillomania with a wide variety of topics, things like this one, um, about navigating conversations with uh, loved ones about trichotillomania, lots of different topics. We have Q&A sessions with our therapists, and we even have recordings of our mindfulness workshops. So you can work on mind practice mindfulness uh, with a recording of our uh, mindfulness experts also. So uh, here are just a summary of our free resources. So these are for our subscribers and non-subscribers and really we encourage everyone to use them. So like uh, I said, we have monthly webinars that are for free. We have online forums and blogs that you can access through our website at tricksop.com. So our online forums, really they're a great place that you can ask questions and interact with people uh, facing similar challenges online. You can do this anonymously, kind of like I said, um, earlier in terms of asking questions um, or sharing about your story anonymously. Um, and then also our blog. So we actually even have a recent article published um, about uh, social media and BFRBs or body-focused repetitive behaviors. Uh, they call it double-edged sword. And then finally, I wrote a, a handle for social media. So at trickstop.com and follow us. Um, and like I said, it's really great also for, for loved ones that you can ask them to follow along so that they can understand a little bit more about what you're dealing with or if you want to support somebody else. Um, it's a great resource. Okay, 
So today we started with a really brief overview about social media and about its users in 2024. We talked about social media and body image and really the idea that with more and more exposure to social media, you're seeing more kind of unattainable or perfect images on uh, social media. And th this often leads us to compare ourselves and internalize these ideal standards, which ultimately leads to lower self-esteem, poor body satisfaction. And then specifically with hair pulling disorder, there's this societal idea, ideal of having thick, luscious hair. And then those comparisons to seeing all of these ideals often lead to poor body satisfaction. Next, we talked about social media and mental health challenges. So we talked about the cons in terms of misinformation, about bullying, self-diagnosis, the triggers. We talked about the pros in terms of fostering community, challenging stigma, providing tips on access to mental health care. And then I showed a promising um, content analysis about the 100 most viewed YouTube videos on Trick or Tell Man. And really they showed that they were, the majority of these videos are really uplifting and foster a sense of community. And then finally, I gave you guys um, an overview of the social media platforms and the channels that we have here at TrickStop and showed that these are really great resources for you to follow. Um, and so I kind of just, the thing I want to leave you guys with in conclusion today is that I really hope in today's presentation that you, you've seen that there really are some aspects of social media that we really need to be careful about and think critically. That's kind of a big, big uh, takeaway here is to think critically about things that you see on social media, but also the idea that social media can truly be a helpful tool um, in your recovery journey for dealing with hair pulling disorder, that it can help you feel a sense of community, foster a sense of belonging, and make you feel that you're not dealing with this alone. So um, like I promised, here is the $100 discount for the first month of subscription to TrickStop. So if you use the promo code ProWeb100, um, and now if anybody, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but we can give time for that. So I'll wait around for somebody to write any questions that you have in our Q&A. But if you have any more personal um, questions that you want to ask more clinically, you can email me at my at helpingminds.com or you can contact if you have technical questions about our program. You can ask cont uh, contact your customer support at support at trickstop. Okay. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Please don't be shy. Really, they're typically people are thinking the same thing that you are, have urgent questions, but are maybe shy or whatever to um, ask. So please don't hesitate. Okay, so the first question is, am I able to help my trick without a therapist? Um, great question. Uh, I think uh, it depends. I think uh, I'll tell you what research shows. Research shows that, that the gold standard of treatment is called habit reversal training, so or HRT, if you've ever heard of that. So first of all, we have... Um, online webinars, recordings of webinars that explain what HRT is. So if you look up trickstop.com uh, on YouTube or trickstop and look up HRT, um, you can find a webinar dedicated specifically to that. Um, so that is really a type of treatment that has been shown to help the most with uh, reducing symptoms of trichotillomania. Now, can you do this without a therapist? Great question. It's, I think it totally depends on, on how diligent you are, how um, 
how quickly you grasp concepts, how uh, self-disciplined you are. Look, I think a therapist is always helpful because I think it's helpful to have an outside perspective and kind of to bounce ideas back on, to fine tune, to have somebody who's an expert in the area to kind of help guide you through the program um, or through the, through the tools, the treatment. Um, our program, it's online, it's all done online. Um, and you're with, a, you're working with a expert therapist. So that might be a help, uh, kind of mid ground for you, because if, uh, you don't want to go to in-person therapy sessions, this might be kind of a good, happy medium. Other questions? Please don't be shy. <laughs> it's a good question so far. All right. Oh. So, okay, so the next question is, how long is the average recovery period? Um, so that's actually a really challenging question because the, the, first of all, in terms of recovery, first of all, we often like to think of paraphilia disorder as kind of a lifelong struggle that you're gonna have to deal with for, the, for your whole life. It's gonna be, there's always gonna be different periods of time where different urges are gonna come up um, so it's important to manage expectations. You could have a period, a long period of time in which you don't pull at all, and then you could have a relapse down the line. And that's also part of it. Um, if you're asking, so I don't know how to answer that exactly. And then in terms of also in terms of treatment time, it's also very different. It varies between people. It varies um, even the use of our program, Trick Stop. It varies among um, clients. Some clients use it for months at a time. Um, some clients are in it for a much shorter time. Um, it really, I think, um, you know, a lot of different factors that go into it. It has to do with how uh, diligent you are doing your homework, how much you communicate with your therapist. Uh, there's a lot of different factors. Um, but yeah, you can also always start and you have the first month uh, discount. So you could always start and then see how, see how you feel. Great question, guys. Okay, so if there's nothing else, um, we'll end today, we'll stop the recording. And hope you guys have a great day. Bye.